The central position of the Arabian Gulf in the Middle East has made Dubai an ancient trading port. Food and materials, gold and silver, have flowed through it for generations. Today, it's the commercial capital of the United Arab Emirates and major trading center in the Arabian Gulf. Under its ruler, Sheikh Rashid bin Said Al Maktoum, it has become one of the most rapidly developing areas in the world. His dynamic policies have greatly stimulated trade and created a host of new projects in all aspects of social and commercial life. But the vigorous development of Dubai has meant that many ships have arrived with cargoes from all parts of the world and found there weren't enough berths for them all. They have to anchor out in the Gulf and wait. At one stage, it was common to see over a hundred ships lying at anchor, waiting to unload, and sometimes waiting for months. Sheikh Rashid realized the problem needed large-scale action and needed it immediately. His Highness remembered the area called Jebel Ali beside the Gulf, close to the main road running through the Emirates. He realized the possibilities of building a great harbor that would berth dozens of ships and be the focal point for a vast new industrial complex. Another opportunity to guarantee the economic future of Dubai. In 1976, His Highness outlined his plan a harbour as big as the ports of London or New York, to take 70 or 80 ships with drafts up to 14 and a half metres and completed in four years. And develop around the harbour a wide range of facilities for mariners and industrial activities. To build such a harbour meant excavating enough earth to build a wall around the world, half a metre wide and three metres high. The surface area alone would hold more than 800 jumbo jets. It would easily take 90 great pyramids of Egypt. Or more than 150 35,000 ton tankers. Although investigations had not been completed, the ruler called on world experts to join with him in the great enterprise. His Highness saw the importance of getting on with the job. Any obstacles the investigation might reveal could only be a temporary nuisance. The new harbour would be a permanent asset. This was the gigantic project embarked on when His Highness, with the Crown Prince and the Prime Minister, signed the agreement for work to start in 1976 with Arabian, British and Dutch contractors. This was the vision that was to change this desert by the Gulf into one of the great harbours of the world. Mina Jebel Ali, the port of Jebel Ali. In May 1976, survey teams moved onto the site. So began the long process of turning a vision into reality. The main road through the Emirates became the road to Jebel Ali, and the desert heard the great project begin.
creating the Great Harbour called for the largest construction equipment that had ever been made anywhere. International supply companies received the biggest orders they'd ever had. The sand hills of Jebel Ali began to be reformed by $50 million worth. By mid-1976, buildings and roads began to appear. On the 21st of June, the first dredger began to eat her way across the beach from the open sea. Mina Jebel Ali had started. Cutters such as these were lowered underwater from eight dredgers that had been mobilized from all available sources. While special jumbo dredgers were being built in Holland and two giant dipper dredgers were towed from North America. Working 24 hours a day, they began to form the entrance channel and the sea began to flow into the desert. At the inauguration ceremony, Sheikh Rashid was able to show the President of the United Arab Emirates, Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan Al Nahyan, the birth of probably the most important project in the Middle East, a project which, with its attendant industrial complex, was a giant stride towards the future prosperity of their Emirates. Rather than have the entire harbour ready all at once in four years, it was decided to release wharfage for use as the harbour was built in stages. Stage one, six wharves by 1978. And stage two, a group of wharves 12 months later and then groups every six months. To provide the wharves and the services they needed, the harbour was designed as a main channel and two basins with its entrance protected by sea walls running out into the gulf. Stage one was to dredge out the entrance channel and the first basin build three kilometers of seawall out into the gulf to give a protected entrance, complete five wharves by 1978, build a further three kilometers of wall offshore to contain the main reclamation area, solve all the design and technical problems for the whole harbor, mobilize the necessary plant and labor, and have the next stage well underway. International experts combined on the many design and construction problems. At the Wallingford Research Station in England, a model of the harbour was built to study the effect of waves from the Gulf. The results indicated the best alignment for the approach channel and the seawalls to give maximum protection from wave action to both ships and the harbour. A total length of three kilometers of seawall was called for, made from over a million tons of rock. Rock deliveries commenced in September 1976 from quarries 35 kilometers away. Deliveries by a continuous stream of trucks built up from 25,000 to 75,000 tons a week. In mid-1977, the total length of breakwater was extended to over five and a half kilometers, requiring the delivery of rock to be increased to nearly four million tons. To house the army of workers, a new town was built close to Jebel Ali, where none had been before. Over 300 homes in the desert, with fresh water, electricity and drainage, a school and clinic, and all the essentials of a modern town. At the time His Highness made the decision to build the harbour in June 1976 and complete it in four years, no design for the project had been considered. Normally, the design alone would take several years. The only way to meet the schedule was to mobilize every bit of equipment and material in sight and set them to work instantly. Before many months had passed, great cavities began to appear amongst the sand hills. To protect the breakwaters that ran out into the gulf from the continual wave action, 
31,000 concrete blocks called stay bits were made to armor the sea walls. massive dredging operation had been undertaken by a joint Arab-Dutch company. Their analysis of dredging out the harbour at the fast rate the ruler asked for indicated that normal dredges were inadequate and called for the building of four giant dredges with the extremely high power of 2,000 horsepower per cutter. The first two were launched in Holland in September 1977. The first was launched by Mrs. Ahmed Bakker, the wife of the man who put together the worldwide expertise that made Jebel Ali possible. The second jumbo, Jumeirah Bay, was launched by Mrs. Lowry, wife of the general manager of the dredging company. The jumbo dredgers were floated 12,000 kilometers from the North Sea to the Arabian Gulf on Giant Two the world's largest submersible barge. To obtain the required depth for safe entrance to the harbour, the approach channel had to run 18 kilometres out into the gulf. To keep the American Dipper dredgers working accurately, laser beams were set up ashore to keep them on station, despite the tides and weather. A scientific monitoring organisation was established to watch for any possible adverse effects the building of the harbour might have on marine life. Early investigation had revealed a hard material in the substrata that prevented the use of sheet piling for the wharf walls. To overcome this problem and still have five wharves ready for ships by 1978, a revolutionary wall was designed. The extreme hardness of the substrata had prevented sheet piles from being driven down to more than an average of 13 meters. The revolutionary idea was to use tubular steel piles joined together by interlocking clutches to prevent the layers of sand which were being retained from escaping between them. then placed them in position in such a way that the ends achieved a firm grip in the hard substrata. To do this, a work routine was established of drilling several holes at a time down to a depth of 13 meters, and then drilling out the necks between them to make a long slot. Steel piles were then inserted down to the depth of each hole. An auger was let down the inside of each pile to drill out a further five meters. After the spoil had been removed, each pile was vibrated down the remaining five meters, taking off a thin slice of the inside wall as they went, thus ensuring that the ends were tightly held in the hard substrata. The tubular piles were then cleaned out and a concrete plug placed in the bottom of each. A capping beam was cast over the piles and tie rods fixed the piles to an anchor wall. This unique solution meant that the first keys could now be completed on schedule despite the problem.
By 1978, an army of equipment was at work. On the land, giant excavators, drag lines and trucks. And on the water, a fleet of eight dredgers with boosters, barges, tugboats and 20 kilometers of disposal pipe. Behind the massive dispersal of equipment, the workforce had risen to over 4,000 men. The end of stage one began to appear. To excavate the basins and keep to schedule, 13 dredges would have been necessary at once, which was quite impossible in the space available to manoeuvre them. It was therefore decided, after extensive tests, to dewater the area by pumping out the underground water. The basins could then be excavated in the dry, using open-cut excavation methods, and the key walls could be constructed in the dry at the same time. To shorten the trips for the trucks loaded with spoil from the excavating, the main road was raised so that a culvert could be built beneath it, giving the trucks a shorter, uninterrupted run. The bulk of material dredged and excavated was utilized for reclamation and the raising of land for industrial development. In parallel with the development of stage one, intensive studies looked for a wharf wall design for stage two, the remainder of the harbor. Thirteen different designs were considered, logistics, economics, advantages and disadvantages. Evidence and experience finally pointed to an old design dating back to Roman times. Mass block work, stacks of huge concrete blocks. It was the first time that this type of wall had been built on such a scale in the dry in a dewatered excavation. To make and lay the staggering total of 65,000 blocks required in the time allowed presented formidable logistical problems. To achieve the schedule, a sophisticated block-making plant was built, incorporating the latest techniques. Forty trucks had to work continuously, day and night, seven days a week, hauling 25,000 tons of aggregate a week 
from the quarries in the Hatta Mountains 130 kilometers away. Cement had to be shipped in from overseas at the rate of a thousand tons a day. Every concrete mix had to be used within the hour. And 140 45 ton blocks had to be made and laid every day. Using all available modern techniques and worldwide experience, this gigantic effort was set in motion and maintained, making the completion a reality. By February 1978, stage one had been completed, on schedule. Five berths were ready. All design and construction problems had been solved. And the next stage was well underway. Mina Jebel Ali was ready to receive ships. <laughs> 